what is important to understand first is like what what energy availability is, and then we can say what is low energy availability. So, um, you know, broadly speaking, energy availability is the uh, the energy uh, from dietary intake that is available for physiological processes. What does this mean? Is that we basically eat food that has energy, and when we subtract the energy. Uh, from exercise, uh, the energy used towards uh, the, 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 the exercise or the energy cost of exercise, that energy available is the energy availability for ma maintenance of the... The rest of the stuff to keep us alive and pump basically, and ventilate the lungs and all that good stuff, right? Yes, yes, exactly. And, you know, <clears throat> this is the, the, the current definition that we use for uh, energy availability as it's applied in, in humans. It's, it's not what originally was uh, def defined us when, we, when it was um, defined in the, in the 80s for using like rodent models where they, they consider energy availability, any, any energy available in the, in the um, rodents for, for energy, so in, in, inclusive the, the fat stores. For us in humans, we just consider basically the, the day-to-day uh, energy intake, the input of energy, and then the, the output of energy is mainly the uh, exercise energy expenditure. Yeah. So the calculation or the definition of this uh, can, can be defined mathematically in a very simple terms, which is the energy intake minus the exercise energy expenditure normalized uh, to the fat-free mass, which is the more metabolically active tissue i guess this is where a, a lot of the papers and discussion really jumps off doesn't it because that idea of being able to calculate something so cleanly from a, a direct standpoint a mathematical standpoint and when we go from the lab into the field you know there are obviously as you know those complexities that come up so could, can you talk us through you know a few areas like being able to you know the pitfalls of measuring energy intake you know between food recalls and interviews and questionnaires you know how accurate are those really when we're looking at intakes for, for clients or athletes? Yeah, so um, one, one of the issues here is that, you know, a lot of these like really clear cut, you know, definitions of what is normal energy availability and what is low and so on comes from a lab-based studies where we can control very much exactly how much energy people are expending in the lab and how much people were giving them to, to, to uh, giving to our participants. The problems, you know, when you go to the field, it's like it's incredibly, incredibly difficult to really quantify this uh, precisely. So there's there's a lot of error in, in the measurement. So there's different ways of measuring energy intake and there's different ways of uh, measuring energy expenditure. Mm -hmm. Of course, what we are more interested in is like exercise energy expenditure. So the energy expenditure are allocated from, from, from exercise only. And there's a lot of caveats of, the you know, the different methodologies of, yeah, dietary recalls. <clears throat> also, because when we want to see the effect of uh, energy availability or low energy availability, normally we need to know this over prolonged periods of time. And, you know, even if you can have a really controlled, you know, follow-up of dietary intake over a week, let's say, of a, of a, of a participant or if an athlete, um, probably even though in one week you can see some some of the effects of this energy availability, you probably need like months of, of, of data to know exactly what is happening. And then it becomes very, very difficult to be precise in the measurements. Yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, this idea of when you're researching it and studying it, having some bigger gaps, really, some the bigger increases and drops in the amount of energy available you know, the, the study you noted around male cyclists where on certain days there's an excess and other days there's a dramatic drop and there's actually, you know, no real difference in some of those biomarkers, which we'll talk about in a minute. But as we build this out over weeks and months, then it becomes potentially obviously more problematic, not just from a performance standpoint, but obviously from a health standpoint. So are there some, you know, some low marker points that we should be looking out for with athletes where things start to go wrong? Well, yes, uh, yes, and, and no. So <laughs> we have some some data. You know, there's there's a lot of data, sort of from cross sectional studies, where we pick populations that we think they might have been exposed to low energy availability. There are like some clear markers of you know being exposed to, to low energy availability, and we have some data from experimental studies which are quite you know quite short in time, where this uh, low energy availability is well controlled. Mm. Traditionally, the, the, the way in which uh, low energy availability was kind of 
detected in, in sort of the, the, the symptoms observed in particularly in female athletes, which was the first type of athletes where this was studied, was basically bone mineral density and menstrual function. There was, <clears throat> this is, you know, the, the, the female athlete triad, which considers the coexistence of low energy availability, low bone mineral density and alteration of uh, menstrual cycle. Um, basically points towards these, these very important symptoms of, of chronic low energy availability. Yeah, and I suppose that's after, that's the end of the spectrum, isn't it? Over time of getting to exactly. those points, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So that's that's sort of, when you see that, it's a bit too late. <laughs> so, <laughs> so going off the cliff at that point. Yes, yes. So, the, the, you know, there's there's a, a cascade of events. The first thing that responds in, in your body t- typically is your 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 metabolism and your uh, sort of your hormones? So these things seem to, to be the, the ones that first start to pick up that you're in like low energy availability. Yeah. So not consuming enough or training too hard or typically a combination of both, right? Yeah, exactly. So that we didn't go very much into detail there, but the way to get yeah, to the reduce energy availability is either keep eating the same that you eat every day and then train train harder, train train expend more energy in exercise, or just eat less, or a combination of both. So you can have someone who you know doesn't change the diet; they are effectively eating normally. Yeah. Uh, but they're, they're still their body is like oh this is like some sort of starvation response even though you know the athlete is not starving so training for an ultra marathon and you haven't adjusted the the intake pretty for much example. yes <laughs> and this is something that we see on the on the field you know when we start to be really detailed in the quantification of uh, intake and expenditure it's, it's very clear that when when athletes expend a lot of energy they don't really sort of compensate for the exercise energy expenditure yeah, and, and some of that earlier work done in, in women where, you know, you're looking at four or five days of this energy availability being, you know, sort of roughly less than 30 kcal uh, per kilogram fat-free mass per day. And then even then we're starting to see some some shifts in some of those endocrine and metabolic markers. Would that be correct? Correct, yes. So uh, I think that there is, as I was saying before, that there is some sort of a chain of events that starts with the metabolic and endocrine responses. So the first things that you normally see to respond to low energy availability are things like leptin seems to be very sensitive, but normally it's hard to measure in or get it measured in a, in a commercial lab. And most of them don't do leptin It's more for research, mm-hmm. but you know, things like uh, FT3 or like uh, T3, that's one that, that seems to be quite, quite sensitive and uh, particularly in, in, in females. T4, not so much. IGF-1 seems to be uh, quite sensitive as well. Uh, so these are, are parameters that are, are good, you know, to, to look uh, into when you are potentially working with someone that might be exposed to periods of, of low energy availability. Yeah, I was going to say, it's interesting on the thyroid front, obviously in athletes, we tend to run, docs will tend to run more of the T3 as well, but oftentimes in a recreational athlete or client, you know, it's only T4 that might be run. And so can yes. you... Talk through obviously the thyroid hormones are the main regulators here of, of arresting metabolic rate. Well, why T3 potentially not T4 so much? So T3 is like the, the more sort of active hormone. So you know T4 is convert, converted to T3 in different tissues, mm-hmm. particularly in the brain as well. There's a conversion from from T, T4 to to T3. Yeah. So basically, what you measure when you measure T4 is whether you know the if there is a less or more circulating of the of inactive hormone, that if you have hypothyroidism, yeah. then that, that might be something that you can detect. But in this case, it's, it's different. It's more like the conversion from one to the other. So when you are in low energy availability, it's less of a conversion of T, uh, T4 to T3. And even some studies see a tendency and increase in T4 uh, with, low, with low energy availability, which is interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. And, and it's interesting when I look at the, the, you know, the numbers in your paper around, you know, even at 25 kcal per kilogram fat free mass, for that kind of five day period, we're seeing decreases um, in a sort of a dose response relationship going down towards 20, 19, 18. So that's uh, at that point, even if we're picking it up, that's a pretty low intake for for that week or that five days, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. And, you know, some of the things that are kind of tricky here is when we see changes in these hormones that 
uh, might be subclinical. So it's it's hard to you know run a test in this hormone and say like oh you know like this person definitely, is definitely this. <laughs> yes because you know I think what is important to consider is the within individual variations in the hormone because there might still be within a, a clinical uh, uh, values but the, the the thing is that it's dropped. You know, that's, I think that Relative is to that athlete or individual, right? Yes, exactly. And I, and I think, you know, this, this is what it makes, makes it hard to pick up sometimes because uh, most of the time it's just one test, you know, every now and then, and you go like, oh no, it's fine. It's within the, 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 the clinical range. But when you look at, you know, when you have the opportunity to look at many athletes or many individuals as we do in, in the research studies, that's de definitely going down. So I think, you know, for, for in this case, it's important to know you, the, the error of measurement of, of the hormones that you're measuring, uh, how much it normally varies within that, 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 that person and so on. So it requires a, a bit of, you know, like attention to detail, but it's, it's something that can, can give some, some guidance before, you know, things uh, get disrupted further.